old school ties. My father originally was a village schoolmaster in <coughs> Somerset when he was in his early 20s and he saw a job advertised at Haslingdon Technical School in the Rossendale Valley and I think he must have thought that it was countryside because it was called the Rossendale <laughs> Valley and when poor mother saw the moors and the mill chimneys and the smoke and the clogs and the shawls she said she couldn't live here but she did for 40 years. <laughs> The atmosphere was very dirty in those days. Though, wasn't oh, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. We used to stand in our shop window and you looked over and there was a haze always. Mm. It's quite clear now and beautiful. And the houses were all black stone. That's right. I thought they were built of black stone mm. when I was little. Mm. Yep. And it was lovely going into the mills if you weren't used to them. The machinery mm -hmm. mm -hmm. clacked and the women mm -hmm. shouted. And on Saturdays when the mill was empty, we used to go in and get into the uh, skips which with the top the raw cotton and slide right down the chutes to the bottom of the mill. Molly Walrun's father was maths teacher at Haslingdon Grammar School and Molly herself was a pupil there in the years between the two world wars. So were Bessie Boylan, George Tomlinson, Jim Howarth, Kenneth Parker, Don Rishton, Anne Taylor, Mary Riley and Bob Whitaker. Those last three started secondary school together in September 1919 in the Victorian building on Berry Street, which had begun life as a library before becoming Haslingdon Grammar. I was so timid. People always said when they came to see us, I would hide behind my mother's skirts. So when I got to school amongst this vast quantity of people, to me, I used to look round and think, oh, what is it going to be like today? We'd only had two teachers at the little school where I was. Did you feel special because you were at the grammar school? Oh, yes. Yes, we were special. I had a mile and a half to walk, and then a train to Rotenstall, and a tram up here. And I must say that for the first two or three weeks, I wasn't too happy about no. it at all. But uh, I was head boy for a time and, and uh, captain of the football team and cricket team and so on. So I felt that it was my school. I've always felt that. It's been my life almost, this school. Bob Whitaker is Haslingdon's own Mr Chips. He went on to teach mathematics and football at the school for 25 years. But one of Haslingdon's most famous old boys, a man who also made a career in education, is Sir Rhodes Boyson. He was at the school from 1936 to 1943. It was a very good cross-section. I came from, what you can say, working-class, labour, Methodist background. My father was the secretary of the Hardways Cotton Spinners. He was the labour leader in the town and had been since before I was born. The only socialist councillor for years in the town. But there were people there who were the owners of the mills. Their sons went and daughters of those were in the mills. There was the small shopkeepers, there were the farmers. There were the news agents' children. It would be as good a cross-section of the whole town as any cross-section it would ever be. In a way, it was a strange classless society. I mean, one knew that somebody's father was an employer of considerable amount of labour, but it never affected my relationships with them or theirs with me. It was built of great stone blocks and it had very big windows, I think because it was a library. And it was very airy. The classrooms were airy yeah. and light. A typical school smell, I think. <laughs> Varnish in the hall, that's one thing I remember. Mm. Disinfectant, you could smell that. The things I remember, those stone steps going on. Yeah, it's had a dip in the centre. So much, you know, feet had gone up and down. Most people saw it as a move from blue collar work to white collar work. In the 1930s, when we had very heavy unemployment and a lot of the cotton spinners in my father's union were unemployed, people at the town hall kept their jobs and people in offices kept their jobs. It was the security, you were there for a pension at the end. The grammar school was a way to the white collar job. It was the town school, the town as a whole had a pride in it, and the grammar school as a result went out into the town 
and there was this great feeling of a oneness. The fact, I suppose, that the school badge was the town coat of arms. Mm. Yes. The only thing is, was that theirs was nothing without labour, mm. and ours had a Latin tag, but it was the same. We had um, nice gym slips, you know, two big box pleats down the front, two big box pleats down the back. And we had Shantung blouses. Well, never, I don't know what's happened to Shantung. It, it's just disappeared, hasn't it? It's like crepe de chine. It's one of those things. But it was very, very nice, soft, silky material. And we wore brown woolen stockings, summer and winter. Uh, they weren't running winter, but, God, they were hot and uncomfortable in summer, you know. They were hideous things, really. And they didn't fit properly. Uh, they were horrible. And then we had the school blazer, which was navy blue, and it had... Um, HDS on the pocket, as in grammar school, unless you were a prefect, in which case it had the coat of arms on. And our hats, there were um, all these sort of pulling basin hats, you know, the, the usual, they just sort of sat on with a brim all the way around. Straw in summer and velour in winter. The velour ones were very nice, actually. But for some families, it must have been quite expensive. I didn't wear the uniform for the first term, I remember it, because we just couldn't afford it. I mean, we, we were poor that way. We were non-conformist poor, that's different from other poor, in the sense every bill was paid, but there was no spare money. It was just a question at that time. The priorities had been made, and there was no, no money left for Rhodes' uniform. <laughs> and I think for a long time I was the only boy in the first year without uniform. Maybe that made me belligerent for the rest of my life. I think in those days, uh, Miss Morton used to oh, organise oh, a, fort a weekly oh, or fortnightly inspection oh, yes. of the girls in the school hall. Yes. The boys were compelled to leave, and the most lurid rumours used to <laughs> circulate <laughs> and what went on in this. I, ca I can let you into a secret. How <laughs> so can I? I have, I'm one of the people who have gone through the veils, you might say. Uh, I know that there was a notice used to go on the hall doorway sort of out of bounds, private, keep out. <laughs> and the whole of the front of the stage, there were girls kneeling along the front of the stage and she was going around with a ruler yeah, to make sure yeah, that the gym, gym slips slip, that's right. just came to the bottom. Well, they just had to touch the back of your calf of your leg. My um, mother used yeah. to make me wear a long sleeve vest under the chanson flag. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was covered with confusion when we had to take them off the gym. <laughs> right, when I say go... Run towards me. Ready, go! For physical education, it was non-existent. We didn't have anything. This is 1919 to 26. Mm. We, we hadn't got a, a gym at all. We had some drill, I, I think, the first yeah. year was drill. Marching from one corner of the yard to another corner. And the history teacher took it, and she hated it, I'm quite sure. Getting us into um, mm. good soldiers, just marching. And right arm, left arm, and all this business. And country yeah. dancing up the corridors. There's nowhere else to do it. It was a bit different in my day, by the time I went. It wasn't all that long after. We'd got the gym. And Mr. Law and the gym teacher, do you remember Mr. Yeah, Law? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yes. She would go down and stay on when the fifth form and the sixth form were down there doing sport on a Wednesday afternoon. And she would bring down her cricket bat and her pads because Miss Alone paid for English ladies against the Australian ladies. And when the official period was over, she'd say, come along, boys, and she'd put a sixpence on the off stump and a shilling on the middle stump and say, try and bowl me out now. <laughs> there was this sort of spirit that existed. The problem we had, I think, was that we had a Mr. Jenkins yes. to oh, teach I.G. Jenkins. <coughs> That's right, I.G. Yes. Well, Jenkins. But after about 12 months, he left. Called, uh, called up, for yeah. He was called up. Yeah. And I think Neil MacTaggart yes. 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 Well, he, he was, was the art teacher. Oh. Yes, he was. <laughs> but it wasn't highly organised as a PE lesson. <laughs> but it was very enjoyable. <laughs> he was very handsome. Oh. And uh, the girls <laughs> were always in a flutter about him. Just a young man. And very handsome. Oh, very handsome. Mm -hmm. He used to wear silk shirts. And, you know, when he leant over your shoulders and cracked your drawing, you went, oh. I was head boy from 1925 to 26. And I was head girl from 26 to 27. I remember you as head girl. You used to stand at the bottom of the stairs, and if we ran down the stairs, you would make us go to the top and walk down again. <laughs> I remember being yep. put in detention with uh, Susan Holden, Susan Walsh that was, 
we were in uh, the physics lab downstairs and Susan Holden said to me when he comes in let's get under the table and hit his legs with this metre rule <laughs> <laughs> so when Mr Adamsey came in we were under the table and we were fishing about but his legs oh that got that, punishment we were both put in detention <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember once uh, during assembly Mr Weston uh, who was a great disciplinarian as you oh, yeah. know mm-hmm. and he suddenly announced we'd best of all and went outside his study after assembly well you know, he went sick and his knees wobbled and wondered what on earth I'd done. What I had done, actually, I persuaded my mother to buy me a pair of Lyle's stockings. And they're fully fashioned and they're fitted and they have clocks at the side. They were beautiful. And I went outside his study and I was told to get home at dinner time and change back into, you know, brown woolen ones like everybody else. And that was, it wasn't actually a discipline, but I was meant to be very, very small. I think the cane was much more frequently used then than perhaps ten years later. Coming late, for example, warranted the cane if you did it often enough. I remember a, a person standing next to me in the hall during assembly. He's now a member of staff here. We were talking to each other, and the headmaster at the front picked him out, I was lucky, and said, Ayrton, leave the hall. <laughs> so Jack Ayrton went out to the hall. The following morning, the same thing happened. Unfortunately, he was picked again. Ayrton, leave the hall, and he received the cane for that. (laughs) Oh, Musbury, I was in Musbury, 1933. 1931 to 2, oh, there's me, and you all run. I feel quite young again. (laughs) I was at school until 1926, and up to that time there wasn't a house arrangement at all. But when Mr. Lodge was appointed, uh, he introduced the house system. And he called the houses after the local hills. Uh, Holcomb Hill and Musbury and Grain and Cribden. There was a shield for schoolwork. And if you look at the shields in the, in the corridor out here, they show <coughs> who, the, who the head boy and head girl were who the prefects were. Mary Riley. Well, I'll be blessed. Well, I don't know. Head girl, Mary Riley. And who is he? Edgar Riley. Oh, That's yes. a cousin of mine. He became a headmaster, Ed- didn't yes, he? Yes, in Yorkshire. We felt very loyal to our houses. I was the head of Musbury House. And I met somebody quite recently, who I hadn't seen for many years, and she said, do you remember when you were in Musbury House and we won all the sports that yes, year? Yes. So she must have uh, remembered it for all those years with pride. And we were proud if we won the sports or the uh, Shield for Scholarship. And we used to have meetings where we would uh, urge them on, like generals urging on the troops, <laughs> so that we did better each year. <laughs> Two classes came in, a scholarship class and a non-scholarship class each year. And the scholarship class was called the, the A stream and the non-scholarship class the, the B stream. And there were about 25 to 30 in each. It was intended that the A stream did their examinations in four years to GCE, or the school certificate at that time, and the B stream in five years was the, the big difference. And the taking of Latin. I was in the B stream there. My, I uh, didn't pass the 11 plus and but my father insisted on missing in the other entrance of the examination and I think the fees were it was either £9 a year or it was £9 a term. You had to take English, you had to take one foreign language, you had to take maths, you had to take one of the physics subjects, physics or chemistry, I took chemistry. One of the art subjects you could take, uh, history, geography or what have you. And then there were other subjects which took, I mean, I took art and history of art, and um, I took domestic science, but they didn't count. Those others, you had to have those, and if you picked on one of them, you just got nothing. I don't know whether it was quite as fair as it is now. Perhaps we didn't get English language, so we got nothing at all. You got no certificate, you got absolutely nothing at all. So, in some ways, it was more difficult, but at the end of it, uh, if you had a school certificate, you'd have good all-round knowledge, really. The choice in the fifth form was domestic science 
or physics or Latin. Yes. Mm. Apart from two girls who took physics, all the all the girls opted for domestic science. Have you all got your tents prepared? Don't, don't start with melting anything until you have prepared. Parking biscuits, potato cakes, cottage pie. What else? Ginger sponge pudding. This is actually the cookery book. Yes, that you we had wrote when you were at school. Yes, we wrote it down. Uh, custard sauce, lemon sauce, boiled fish. Oh, wasn't it exciting? Parsley sauce and fish cakes, lemonade. That's a good recipe. And queen of puddings. Notes on suet pudding. Dried eggs and egg powder. And our order of washing up. Order of washing up? Yes. So tell me what the order of washing up is that you learned. Collect all the things to be washed and arrange neatly on or near the sinks, with each with its own kind. Steep pans and dishes with cold water. Unless greasy, then use hot water and a little soda. Get ready hot water and soap. Also a clean, dry towel. Scrubbing brush, etc. Wash in order of cleanliness. The cleanest things first, dear. Turn upside down to drain and wipe dry while still warm. Wash pans and scrub boards. Scrub the sink. Wash the bowl, wash and rinse, towel and dishcloth, dry in open air if possible. The end. <laughs> I hope you wash up properly. Now then, do you it off. Do you still wash up like that? But yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that was done in 1921. Everybody had their own homework diary. Three subjects a night, as usual, half an hour night. a subject. And from time to time, your parents will be asked to sign it. That's right. But by comparison with today, one's parents mm. very rarely went to the school. Mm. It was if it was once a year, yeah. three <coughs> a night, mm. that was about it. Now, you have to remember, <coughs> though, that being a small town, your parents tended to meet quite a lot of the teachers anyway. Yes. Yeah. And so it wasn't as isolated as it, as it looked. Mm -hmm. During the times when I started taking things easy, I used to spend most of my spare time devising a method whereby my father would not meet Mr. Weston at church <laughs> <laughs> on the Sunday morning, because that was the surest way of we getting a thumping from Dad. The staff on the whole were quite friendly, but straight. Straight, yes. We had Mr. Warrand who taught us maths and Dr. Tupling whom I don't think he I don't think he ever liked me history because I could never remember dates Dr. Tupling was the most distinguished Lancashire historian of his time and he was a great scholar he was the sort of person who would have lectured at university with the spread of universities and it was because of him that I became a, an economic historian as he was basically there was one year we were all supposed not to go on holiday is your journey really necessary and those of us who were in the town went to the school every day but it was a kind of a we allocated ourselves to what staff were doing like a project and it was in the middle of school and I allocated myself to Dr Tuplin and we walked the valleys nearby which had begun the industrial revolution and that and the very fact of his ability made me an economic historian I could have been anything at that time. Oh, we had an excellent mm. English Teacher. item, didn't oh, we? Oh, yeah. yes. Miss Bracewell. Yes. Miss Bracewell was, was very, very good. Mm. Yes. Gave us such a love of literature. Yes, yes. 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 Jane Austen in particular. Chaucer's prologue. Oh, oh, no. She was a friend till the day she died. She used to invite us down, a few of the older ones she would have in her home. She was so kind. She was such a kind person. Not like Miss Morton, who was a French lady, you see. French teacher. I don't think she took much to me. I wasn't, you know, the top layer. And she always dressed so beautifully herself. Those lovely shoes I shall never forget. 
I feel a bit sorry for her. She tried to turn us out as young ladies, and she thought us French, but that wasn't the main thing. She tried to turn all her girls, as she called us, into young ladies. I remember she used to take a, a romantic play with us called Air Army, and she used to say, I will take the part of Air Army in the love scenes because you girls have no experience. <laughs> 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 Little she knew. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a small one there? A small one. Yeah. 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 I thank you. Are you These children nowadays, they don't know how lucky they are being able to have what? meals. Oh, we couldn't have meals unless we went out to little shops round about. We hadn't any. <coughs> we could bring our own. My, my parents, my mother used to make them, and we used to bring them to school and heat them in the gas oven. If we didn't have that, we went out to two cafes in Haslingen. Barnes's was one, and Hallam's was the other. And often I had a plain white tea cake with a, a bar of chocolate. Somebody told me that was healthy. <laughs> <laughs> there was another place that we went to called Woods, up by the police station. It was a, a sort of hot meal. You, for a seven pence, I think it was, you could get a bowl of soup, three pennyworth of meat pie, and uh, two pennyworth of rice pudding, you see. On the other hand, it was commonplace for everybody to go to the chip shop on Friday. I don't know why they did, but it was one of those things that it was understood that they went to the chip shop on Friday. So those were the three places. There was a, a one yard for the boys and one yard for the girls. The girls' yard was nearer the school to the north and the boys' yard beyond that, with outside toilets separating the two of us. No, we didn't make some break times. That wouldn't have been nice, would it? <laughs> went on the very first school camp, Mr. Weston started them, in about 1932, and we went to Mount Fecken, and we had to take a ground sheet, and um, that was, we slept on the ground, and sort of made a hole for our hip, and the first day, of course, the heavens opened, and the tents were soaked through, <laughs> and we were making porridge in the open air, with the water spitting onto the, into the porridge, and we burnt it all. And um, one of the boys said, I'm never coming on a school camp again if Molly Wall runs out of this school. <laughs> was the first one that went uh, abroad from the school and Miss Morton took 12 girls, no boys, 12 girls to Paris for a week. It was very, very exciting and uh, I wrote a diary. It seems to consist of nothing but an account of the meals we had and they all sounded a bit horrible. We first visited the Madeleine Church and then Art de Trion to L'Etoile, the Eiffel Tower, Place de la Concorde, Les Invalides. And then came home for lunch. Fish, chops and chips, and apples. And then set off again. This time visited the Louvre, the Parthenon, Notre Dame, where three priests all asked us which part of England we came from. One of them came from Blackpool. Had tea and cakes, and then got to the hotel and uh, lay down until dinner. We had vegetable soup, beef olives with boiled potatoes and salad and custard. It was lovely. Margaret Tattersall was one of them, and her father, Fred Tatty, you know, he was a manufacturer, quite well said, and he sent some money, and um, so for a special treat, she took us with this money, we went to Orly Airport. <laughs> it sounds a funny thing now, but we hadn't seen many aeroplanes no. then, you know, biplanes and things like that, we thought it was terribly exciting at the time. <laughs> I 
Yeah. We had a current affairs lesson every Friday afternoon and we discussed, brought newspapers and discussed what was going on in the newspapers and whether they were biased and whether we should use our common sense about different episodes that were appearing in them. It was just before the war. People knew, I think, that uh, war was going to come sooner or later. And I think we all felt uneasy. But, uh, of course, you go about your ordinary life. You can't, when you're young, you don't worry too mm -hmm. much about what's going to happen in three or four years hence. But you still felt as though you might be living on the knife edge when you did think about it. And we used to listen to Hitler speaking on the wires. We, of course, we didn't do Germans. It sounded so menacing. Deutschland und das deutsche Volk sind schon sehr schwere Katastrophen her geworden. Freilich, ich gebe es zu. Es waren immer Männer notwendig, um die dann erforderlichen Maßnahmen zu treffen und sie ohne Rücksicht auf Verneinung oder Besserwisser durchzusetzen. Ein Haufen parlamentarischer Angsthasen eignet sich allerdings schlecht zur Führung eines Volkes aus Lohnes. During the war, we didn't talk about the war much at school. We did it at home, mm. and and really, the, the objective seemed to be to get the school running smooth as smoothly as possible without any interference in the war if it could be held. I remember Miss Morton in the French room. Mm. Um, she was very upset by what had happened to France. <coughs> she had a big picture of General de Gaulle on the wall. Do you remember? And she used to talk about <coughs> France, uh, mm -hmm. almost reduced to tears. But she used to have a singing patriotic French songs as well. Some of the masters went, the staff who were called up. I read the war news. It was talked about at home. I don't think it had any effect upon the pattern of the school at all, except I joined the air training corps. August 1943, we went pea picking and potato picking at the near Ormskirt, Bickerstaff. We had a hilarious time. Lord Boyson was in charge of one of the tents. I felt it as part of the war effort I ought to go pea picking. I lived on it with quite pleasure. I mean, we, we did a lot of cycling. You know, it was pleasantly social without any tensions at all. We used to sit outside. It was double summertime in those days. It didn't go dark until midnight. And we used to be outside discussing the, the problems of the day. And of course, Rhodes Boyson, he had an answer to all the problems. We, we thought he was going to be a victor, I think. If I had to go back to relive any parts of that, it would be, I mean, the, that summer that we walked those hills. It was the enjoyment of soccer on the pitches. It was um, a, a good hymn sing at the, at the morning assembly. It would be three or four of those things I would go back to. Oh, later, much later, the old students put on a play at the, up at the old grammar school, and I was in it. And after one of the performances, I was walking down the corridor, and Mr. Weston came and walked along with me. He was very, very, a very aloof man, was Mr. Weston. A very, very good at headmaster, but he never fraternised with the pupils at all. And he said, we have a cigarette, Bessie? And I said, thank you very much. And we walked down the corridor chatting and smoking. And I can remember coming home and saying to my husband, for the first time I feel really grown up, Mr. Weston gave me a cigarette. <laughs> the Old School Ties was presented by Jenny Mills and produced by Sarah Rowlands.